EMath 43, let's pick up our last distribution, and it's going to be the sampling distribution of P prime. So it's been a while since we've looked at categorical data. We have been dealing with numerical data since chapter four. So we're gonna flip back finally to categorical data, and we're gonna pick up our second sampling distribution. So we'll be taking random samples, and this time we're looking at some kind of categorical variable. So we'll have frequency counts, and we'll turn those into relative frequency counts or proportions. All right, so we're gonna pick up a bunch of properties and assumptions and rules for the sampling distribution of P prime, okay? This is the one that your book doesn't cover all that well. So at least on our trait table, I put all of the rules here. And so we're looking at the very last column. We're finally getting to this last column. And before we get there, let's just take a look back at where we've come from. All right, so we've actually been dealing with this trait table for a little while. Right? Remember back in chapter four when we looked at tables, right? where we had to list our sample space on the top row because we had discrete numerical data. And then we had our probabilities on that bottom row. All those probabilities had to be numbers between zero and one, and they had to add up to one, right? And then we looked at the special case, the binomial case. And I'm gonna tell you, this, this binomial distribution, it's gonna have some similar properties. You're gonna hear a similar properties when we start to look at the sampling distribution for P prime. They are connected. All right, but we have the binomial distribution. Remember binomial PDF and CDF, all that fun time. And then we went over into chapter five and we looked at the uniform distribution, right? That's when we had the rectangle and we had those properties that we were looking at. Then we went to chapter six, we picked up the standard normal curve. The standard normal curve was the normal curve with Z scores on the X axis. All right, we finished out chapter six looking at any old regular normal distribution, right? Our bell curve, we had all of our properties around that. And this chapter, we've been talking about how we could either start from a normal distribution and work up to a sampling distribution for averages, or we could start with any distribution and still get to the sampling distribution for averages, right? We saw on that app, or on that applet, that we could start with a normal curve and we would stay normal automatically on the sampling distribution. We also started with a uniform distribution, our sampling distribution went normal. We started with the skewed right distribution, our sampling distribution went normal. On that applet, I, I had that really, really ugly distribution, and still our sampling distribution can go normal. So we're gonna look at how that works with categorical data, all right? We're still gonna pick up a center and a standard deviation, or a standard error, I should say, but they're gonna be different formulas than they were in Meanland. And the real big difference is how you assess normality. It is much trickier to assess normality in proportion land. It's just, it takes longer. All right, in, in mean land, the, to, the two checks were relatively easier, easy. Either the population distribution was stated as normal or the central limit theorem kicked in. For the central limit theorem to kick in, in proportion land, it has nothing to do with sample size being 30 or higher. You're gonna hear me refer to you need 10 successes and 10 failures. And then on top of that, you need your sample size, small relative to your population. And we're, we're gonna talk about all three of these, but they, they are mo much more cumbersome to check. Um, it's much easier to assess normality in mean land. All right, so let's start to pick up these rules, okay? So, general properties for the sampling distribution of P prime. Let P prime be the proportion of successes in a random sample of size N from a population whose proportion of successes is P, okay? Denote the mean value of the p prime distribution by mu sub p prime and the standard deviation, or we could call it the standard error, of the p prime distribution by sigma sub p prime. Then the following rules hold. The center for your sampling distribution will be wherever your population distribution is centered. And the center for your population, excuse me, the standard deviation for your sampling distribution has this weird funky formula. Okay, so before we move on, let's just clear up some notation, make sure we're all on the same page. So I, I wanna go right back to here. If we remember P prime, we don't see it that often, but this, this symbol right here is a statistic. It is a sample proportion, okay? This bad boy right here, this is your population proportion. This is a parameter. All right, so going all the way back to chapter one, 
Here's your parameter, it comes from your population. Here's your statistic, it comes from your sample. The only way to find this guy is to, well, the only way to find a parameter is to run a census. And we don't like to run sensi. Again, I don't know if that's the plural, but I don't wanna run a census. Um, so what we do is we just take a statistic and we say that's a pretty good guess for this parameter. All right, we give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. It's gonna be called margin of error once we get to the next chapter. We'll give ourselves some margins and we make our best guess. All right, we go from our statistic and infer to our parameter. And there's some rules that govern us and these are gonna help us when we get to chapter eight. So in terms of the sampling distribution, whatever your population proportion is, that's where we think the center of the sampling distribution will be. Whatever the population proportion, we're gonna use this formula to calculate the standard error. And similarly enough, or I should say similar to what we saw in mean land, all right, you can see here that you have an N in your denominator. So as N increases, as your sample size increases, the standard error will decrease. Okay, and let me write that just a little better. That kind of looks like funky little arrows. So I wanna say this again, okay? As your sample size increases, your standard error will decrease. Or another way of saying that is the standard deviation of your sampling distribution will get smaller, right? Or another way of saying that is variability decreases. And we talked about that in mean land, right? As sample size increases, variability decreases. And these are gonna be the rules that govern our center of our sampling distribution and the standard error of our sampling distribution. All right, now the fun really kicks in because we've got normality. All right, normality is tricky to calculate. So here we go, when N is large, and I can put large in quotes, all right, N being large is very different in proportion land than it is in mean land. So when N is large and P is not too near zero or one, the sampling distribution of P prime is approximately normal. A conservative rule of thumb is that if both n times p is greater than or equal to 10 and n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10, right? and that, another way of saying that is we have at least 10 successes in our sample and 10 failures, and I'll, we'll talk about what this means, then it's safe to assume a normal distribution. But I want you to hear that both of these things have to happen, so we will be doing this check. It's no longer n greater than or equal to 30. It's n p greater than or equal to 10, and 1 minus p greater than or equal to 10. And I'll frequently refer to that as 10 successes or 10 failures. Right? The other assumption, and all of these have to be met, the sample size has to be small relative to the population if you're gonna select without replacement. Okay? And we use this 10% rule in stats. All right. So I want to talk about how, theoretically, if you want trials to be independent, you should sample with replacement. But it's so rare in the real, real world that we sample with replacement. And so to maintain that our trials are independent, we have to make sure our sample size is small relative to the population. And, and I'll talk more about this when we get to chapter 8. I'm going to put a pin in it now, and we're going to work or worry about the mechanics of this, and then I will weave in more and more why we need to do this as we move forward, okay? So with that, let us let me just refer back to our trait table. All right, so you can see all of this here. We've got under this column, we've got our center at P. We've got our standard error at square root P, one minus P over N, all right? In order to get normality, you see all three assumptions must be met. It's harder to do in proportion land. We need NP greater than or equal to 10, and one minus p greater than or equal to 10, and we need the sample size small relative to the population, meaning the population is at least 10 times as large as the sample size. I'll abbreviate this eventually with SSSRTP. This is not um, like a normal stats notation. This is just a, a Miss Abreu thing. So if you go into the STEM Center or some other stats class and you're like, oh, SSSRTP, they, they're gonna think you're nuts. So just know that you'll, you'll see this abbreviation or this acronym in my class and you won't see it anywhere else. All right, so I'm gonna show you the mechanics of this in chapter seven, and we're gonna talk about the why in chapter eight.
Okay, so we're gonna put a pin in the why on earth do we have to worry about this until chapter eight, but I wanna worry about the how on earth do we check this in chapter seven. All right, so with that, let's start to take a look at example nine. Now, as we move through this, I want us to think about what is the variable in this problem, okay? And then we're gonna to have to parse out which is the statistic and which is the parameter. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. But let me scoot this up. I want to leave the rules in view if I can. All right, and let's get the beginnings of this problem. All right, so this says a USA Today poll asked a random sample of 1,012 US adults what they do with the milk in the bowl after they have eaten cereal. Of the respondents, 67% said they drink it. Suppose that 70% of US adults actually drink the cereal milk. Find the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of P prime. Okay, so they want us on a sampling distribution. They've specified P prime here. So if I'm seeing the question in part A, all right, they're directing me to this column because they say sampling distribution of P prime and they want the mean and the standard deviation. So we'll keep that in mind. But before we do any of that, we gotta figure out what is the variable. All right, so it looks like I asked a random sample of 1,000 adults, adults what they do with the milk after they, eat, excuse me, milk in the bowl after they eat the cereal. And 67% said that they drink it. So I wanna see this variable here, right? What do you do with the milk what they do with the milk in the bowl after they have eaten cereal. That is my variable, all right? My data is gonna either be yes, they drink it, or no, they do not drink it, right? That is my categorical variable. So if I write this out, X is what, and these are adults, adults do with milk. after eating cereal. All right, that's what I'm asking each of these 1,012 people. I'm not saying how many bowls of cereal do you eat? I'm not saying do you like cereal? I'm straight up asking you what you do with the milk after you eat the cereal or after you've eaten cereal. And, and it looks like our successes here are drink it and then not drink it. So it looks like I'm keeping track of my successes as drink it. Okay, so again, I wanna mention, this is a categorical variable, which tells me I'm in proportion land. And as we start to go through the rest of these chapters, we're in seven, eight, nine, and 10, you're gonna hear me f try and parse out on most of these problems. Well, which land am I in, mean land or proportion land? Anytime you have a categorical variable, you're in proportion land. There's a couple of other giveaways that you're in proportion land. All right, I see this number here, 67%, and I see 70%. So just take note that I, I see two proportions in here. So I'm just gonna start writing these. You're gonna see me put a little notes in the margins as we start moving forward on these problems. And the first thing I always decide is which land am I in, prop land? or mean land, and this one's in proportion land. All right, now, we have two proportions. So what we now need to parse out is which one of these was the statistic and which one was the parameter, all right? That's gonna become important when we build or when we answer this question. So taking a look at this, one of these two numbers is a statistic and the other one is a parameter. So which one is which? So this says of the respondents, 67% said they drink it. So of the respondents, that's the 1,012 adults. So this one right here is the statistic. Okay. And you can see here, this is 70% of US adults, right? That number right there is the parameter. Okay. So this is our P and this is our P prime. Keeping in mind, this number will never change. The parameter is the parameter. But through sampling variability, this number might change. All right, I have 1,012 US adults of which 67% said they drink it. Imagine if you took another random sample. 
it wouldn't necessarily be exactly 67% again. Maybe it'd be 68 or 69 or, or 70 or 60, right? There's sampling variability, but our particular P prime for these 1,012 adults was 67%. All right, but the reason I'm specifying or making us distinguish this is you want to hunt out the parameter initially. All right, the reason being that if we look at the rules for the sampling distribution of that sample proportion, it says right here that if I want the mean, I need to find P, the center of the population, right? The center is the same proportion as the population. All right, so let's, let's see if we can figure this out. So the mean of my sampling distribution is P. That's what this rule is saying, right? Oh, can we see the rule anymore? Let me scooch that down just a bit so we can see those rules. So the mean of my sampling distribution is P. Okay, so that means in this case, I'm looking at the mean of my sampling distribution being about 70%. Now the standard error has an uglier formula. We're gonna go square root P one minus P over N. So for this problem, we have that the standard error is the square root of 0.7 times one minus 0.7, and I'm gonna put that over our sample size of 1,012, okay? So let's see if we can do this. Let me clear all of this out. So we're gonna want the square root of 0.7 times one minus 0.7 divided by 1,012. So it's looking like we have about a 1.4% margin of error, right? If I move the decimal place two to the right, 1.4%. So my, my center is 70% with a standard error of about 1.4%, okay? All right, and I know that might not, not make a total, like a whole bunch of sense right now, but once we get to part C, I'm hoping it'll solidify a little bit better. All right. So let's take a look at B. We need to answer the question of normality. Can I put the N there? And again, I, I wanna put the N there so I can start calculating probabilities. All right, to figure out if you can put the N there, there are, well, two assumptions you need to check, but one of the assumptions has two parts. So here's what you need to check. You always need to check that you have at least 10 successes in your, in your sample. So is N times P greater than or equal to 10? And at the same time, you need n times one minus p to be greater than or equal to 10. So these are the two most important assumptions. I would call these the deal breaker assumptions. If, if these aren't met, then I'm gonna stop the problem. So let's take a look at what we have here. My n this time out was 1,012, and my p was point, what was it, 70, right? So let's calculate that number. It looks like we're at about 708.4. Okay, let's take a look at n times one minus p. So in this case, we would have 1,012 times that complement. So if I do 1,012 times one minus 0.7, I'm looking at 303.6. All right, I think you'll give me that both of these numbers are greater than or equal to 10. So I'm through the first two assumptions, and, and I, I know I labeled them one and two up here, but assumption one has two parts to it. So I'm just gonna put two little checks here, and let's just contextualize this a little bit. What this is trying to say is if you talk to 1,012 people, I expect about 708.4 of them to drink the milk in the bowl, right? So I'm just gonna contextualize this a little bit more. I'm gonna write it out so that we have some gut feels about what these are. All right, so I'm gonna say here that, and I'll put it up here in a little bubble just so, just so we have it. All right, so this, this is saying about, or we expect 708.4 adults to drink the milk after they eat cereal.
On the flip of that, and I might run out of room, let me extend this. On the flip of that, we also expect Three hundred and three point oops, three hundred and three point six adults not to drink the milk after they eat cereal. One other thing I just want to take note of, if you added these two numbers up, you would get 1,012. So we're saying, really, if this number, if this parameter is true, this is the breakdown I expect. I expect at least 10 successes, or again, a success is you drink the milk after you eat your cereal, and I expect at least 10 failures. So the last little note I want to put here, just so we're seeing this, is that 708.4 plus 303.6 is 1,012, right? So I've broken my sample into successes and failures, at least in terms of what I expect. It looks like I actually saw something slightly different, and that happens all the time. All right, the third thing we need to check is that sample size is small. relative to population. I'm not going to put a check mark yet because I want to show you the mechanics behind how you do this. All right, so here comes my next little bubble I'm going to write. This is how you check it, and we're going to, again, we're using the 10% rule. So take your sample size of 1,012, multiply it by 10, okay? So we're going to multiply this by 10, and then we're going to come up with 10,120 adults. All right. So what you do typically when you're making this, this check, when you're checking this assumption, is it's, a, it's literally a gut check. So I want you to think, out in the U.S., do we think there is more than 10,120 adults? All right. And I think it's a pretty safe bet that there are more than 10,120 adults out in the US. All right, so let me write here, safe bet that there are more than 10,120 adults. And another way of saying that is that our sample size of 1,012 is small. Our sample size is small, relatively speaking, to our population. Right, 1,012 is less than 10% of all U.S. adults, so we would hit that 10% 10 10 threshold, or we're, we're actually well under it. So our sample size is small relative to our population, and that allows us to sample without replacement. And again, I'm going to come back to that theory a little bit more in Chapter 8. But because I can check through all three of these assumptions, or if you want to call this 1A and 1B and this number 2, that's fine. My answer to this question is yes. So I can then say P prime has got a bell curve. I'm centered around 70% and I have a standard deviation of about 1.4%. And that information is going to allow us, one, one, we can use normal CDF, and two, I can start to label and scale my axes, okay? So with that, let's, let's try one of these. All right, so let me scooch this up so we're all seeing it. I've got my normal curve in view, okay. So here we go, find the probability of obtaining a sample of adults in which 67% or fewer say they drank the cereal milk. All right, so I see capital P, I'm going to have some stuff in parentheses, but before we do the parentheses, let's, let's do this. All right, so here we go. We've got P prime now on our x-axis because we're looking at sample proportions. So this is proportion of adults who drink cereal milk. The units in this are percents. 
And since we're, oh, I don't think we can see my x-axis. Let me push that up, sorry about that. All right, and since we're looking at this, at least this sample proportion for the first time together, I'm gonna go ahead and completely label or scale up my, my x-axis or my p-prime axis. So here we go, and it's gonna be pretty cramped. I'm gonna start at 0.7, and let me go three up and three back. Now I'm going to subtract and add 0.014 each time out. So we'll see how this works in terms of if I run into too many numbers trying to do this. So let's do 0.7 plus 0.014 and I'm looking at 0.714. Yeah, this is going to get cramped. This is 0.714. Oh gosh, I really am going to have to write small. Okay, let me add another 0.014. This is now 0.728. And that last one is 0.742. All right, let me go the other way. So 0.7 minus 0.014. We're looking at 0.686. I'm gonna kind of go diagonal to fit them. And 0.658. All right. I've got probabilities, technically the probability P prime along that Y axis. All right, so here we go. Find the probability of obtaining a sample of obtaining a sample of 1,012 adults in which 67% or fewer say they drink the cereal milk. So this time I want the sample proportion to be less than or equal to 0.67, okay? Keeping in mind that it, it doesn't actually matter if you write less than versus less than or equal to. The way the wording is write, written here for this problem, it says 67% or fewer, so it implies the equal sign is there. All right, so let's go 67% along the x-axis. There was 0.7. This was 0.686, so we've got 0.672 here. So I'm pretty close to that tick mark, that z-score of negative two. I'm a little below it. So we're go 0.67, and because it's less than or equal to, I'm gonna shade to the left. All right, so that's a pretty small number when I'm looking at it. Um, that's gonna be like, I don't know, three, three, four percent, somewhere in there, but how about really much less than 50%? All right. So in terms of calculating probabilities, right? if I take a look at this, how to calculate a probability, I'm gonna use normal CDF. And again, this is just for example, it doesn't mean always use this exact formula. And in fact, I won't because the one I writ, writ, wrote out here was for a greater than or equal to, and I had a less than or equal to. All right, so when I'm going less than or equal to, again, my leftmost point is gonna be negative infinity. So here we go. We're gonna go normal CDF and I'm gonna go low, high, my mean was 70, and my standard de deviation or my standard error was 0.014. Let me give myself a little divider line there, and let's see what we're getting. All right, so let's go normal CDF, and we're gonna go low. All right, my high was 0.67, my standard deviation was 0.7, and my standard error was 0.014. Oh, so it's even less than I thought. I just said three, four percent. It's actually closer to 1.6 percent. All right, so we've got 0.16. All right, and that could change just depending on how many decimal points you went. Um, for your standard error. And, and here's what I mean, right? So we got 0.016 when I rounded this to three decimal places, but I just want you to see, you could even get a little bit more accurate in terms of if I kept all of these numbers from this standard error. So if I had really done the whole standard error, 0.7, one minus 0.7 divided by 1,012, right? If I did that, right, if I slaved all of those decimals and I went, hey, let me do normal CDF, of negative infinity to 67%, 0.7, and then I just put that last answer in for my standard error. 
you see I actually get 0.019. So depending on how many decimals you go here, you might get a slightly different answer. All right, this is technically more accurate, um, but, but both of these, whether I got 0.016, like I did up here, or 0.019, I still would have rounded to about 2%. There's about a 2% chance this is gonna happen, okay? All right, so with that, we're gonna look at a different applet all right, and we're gonna see, or hopefully solidify a little bit more how these formulas work and what we're talking about when we say sampling distributions for proportions. All right, thanks gang, bye.